Welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who promised you a romantic weekend for two, but then invited all your friends over because, hey, more people means more fun, right? It's Mr. Lauren Bobgarden. Lauren! What's up, Brent Adams? What's going on? How are you, my friend? I'm doing very well, and you are a you are a terrible spouse. You're a terrible boyfriend. You, you you're just not good in a relationship because you can't just focus on that one on one experience. You you gotta always make it a big group thing where you're you know playing with your friends. And I'm desperately trying to explain the stretch that that intro represents, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> we'll we'll talk about that in more specific details moments from now. And you will under Brent will Brent will force feed you the connection. I'm not saying that it will make a lot more sense, but I'm saying at least you'll understand. That's right. How are you, my friend? How was your week? That those are different things. I my week was good, man. It was. Uh, it's been an interesting, an interesting week for me. Got uh-huh. some game time in, which I'm very happy about. Yeah, how much? I'm curious. We're going to talk about it in the uh, in, in the what we're playing section, uh, which we don't call what we're playing anymore. But no, we don't. But we might as well just change it back because <laughs> we, <laughs> we can't seem to stop calling it that. The road, but uh, it has. It's been interesting. I've not played as much as I wanted to, mostly uh, due to the fact that I've I've been uh, I've been purchasing. And then returning and purchasing and returning furniture this week. <laughs> oh, I've played that game, my friend. We we've been we've desperately been trying to uh, to get a new couch and love seat for our living room because our, our other one was literally falling apart. And so we uh, we took advantage of of a Labor Day sale and got ourselves a new couch and love seat. And then we tried to watch a movie on it, and my back has still not stopped throbbing from that experience. Turns out we bought. The most uncomfortable couch and love seat either of us has ever sat on. Oh, that that is a craptacular experience. I have it's, had that experience. It's not great. So back back they go, and uh, and we went and had to find something else. And it's it's been uh, it, it's just been that kind of week. But I made good use of the time I had, which we'll talk about later on. In what do we call it again? The, the road. road. The road. That's the road. right. <laughs> yeah. but first, we got the garage. The garage, which is not at all like the what we're watching section. And we're going to start off with something that we're watching. This came from <laughs> this came from a viewer. This came from erroneous. This is a trailer for a new series by Area Five. Their YouTube channel has got a trailer for a series called Outer Lands, which is about video game history and culture. And this trailer shows off some of the people and some of the stories that they're going to be exploring in this series. It's a few minutes long, but shows uh, shows great promise and looks like it's well-produced and looks like they will be talking to some interesting people. Indeed, that's true. It's a six-part and series. Sarkeesian. Anyway, what did you I think? think uh, I think I'm, pretty, I'm 99% sure, Brent, that this was actually directly plagiarized from conversations between yourself and myself it does feel that way doesn't it <laughs> yes uh, see if only you'd kept shit between us and not try to invite friends all the time i know right no yeah. uh, this looks like a fascinating uh documentary series six episodes long it looks like it's going to be uh a really interesting exploration into gaming they interview people like ralph bear uh we're going to get to see some people uh do esports and land parties and uh i think we're going to get to see Game a nice jams and comprehensive yeah. history uh, and hopefully, current state of affairs in the gaming industry. So, uh, I think it's going to look really interesting. And thank you to Erroneous for posting this. Yeah, um, everybody, go check it out. It looks like it might be one to watch. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about Need for Speed. They've got a closed beta that you can sign up for. So, uh, Lauren's going to tell you about that, and I'm going to go rearrange my sock drawer. See you later. <laughs> you Forza elitist, you. You Gran Turismo. <laughs> you racing sim elitist. That's right. Yes, that's right. Need for Speed, the upcoming game, which is set to, well, sort of release on November 3rd, Brent. We just turned an announcement, I believe, officially today, at the, on the day we're recording this, that the PC version 
has been pushed to spring of 2016 now because uh, apparently it was going to be frame locked and the PC community was up in arms saying they wanted an unlocked frame rate. So sure. uh, EA said, you know what, we agree with you. So we're pushing out the release till spring. So it seems the PC version will not be coming out until spring. But the, the Xbox One and PS4 versions released November 3rd, uh, which is just around the corner, actually. Um, and this is will be a closed beta for those two platforms. So you can sign up. Get in on the beta, check out the game. I have been a fan of the Need for Speed, uh, I wouldn't say series, but the driving mechanics. There's been a couple of yeah. uh, games from the Need for Speed series that I really enjoy the driving mechanics. They are perfectly arcadey for me, um, and I really enjoy them. And so I will definitely, be, I've signed up for the beta. I will be curious to see, uh, to play this game on the PS4 and see if I enjoy it. Yeah, you know, uh, we were, uh, my wife and I, we were at, uh, we were at a restaurant last week and just uh, you know, having some burgers, and uh, they had a uh, they had an arcade racer. It was like a NASCAR uh, NASCAR arcade racer, and uh, we put uh, we put Z up there, and she grabbed the steering wheel, and uh, she did great. I mean, it was like uh, you know, I just like you know threw some quarters in, and she just you know kind of played on the steering wheel, and I, she came in like third place or whatever. So, uh, so you're yeah, thinking I, she could be top 100 on Need I, for Speed? Well, then. No, I'm just saying that I see why you like those games so much. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I knew uh, this was somehow coming around to a child playing these racing moving. games. Moving. Uh, uh, Ubisoft has revealed the Assassin's Creed Council, and if you were hoping that they were actually going to create a secret society that was going to carry out assassinations throughout the world in order, in, to, <laughs> in order to advance their own worldview, then you're in luck. That's exactly what they're doing. However, no. they're cyber assassins, and they will be mining all of your data to do and so. And then they change their name to Google. Anyway, it's a new social and information hub for the Assassin's Creed franchise. I, like, I basically, I get the impression that what they're trying to do is sort of build a, I don't know, like a community portal specifically for the Assassin's Creed franchise. They talk about how the council is going to be the number one destination for fans of the AC universe. It's going to provide direct access to the people who are creating the games you're going to get exclusive behind the scenes looks at things uh members are also going to be kept up to date via direct live information from the producers and i I think they're going to invent some sort of some sort of service where people will be able to they'll be able to write small posts let's say maybe i don't know 140 characters or less just to pick a number and then they'll be able to to send those posts out and everybody will be able to read them ubisoft's inventing this you understand uh, it's brand new. It's brand new shit. What they're what they're doing here? Never been done before. <laughs> anyway, uh, the membership council is free. Cynical much? Uh, and members were going to be treated to exclusive content. What do they call this? Uh, what do they call this, Brent? In the Halo universe, Halo did one. Call of Duty did one. The fuck would I know about the Halo universe? Call of Duty did one. Right, this sort of hub for information. I yeah. this is uh, this seems like an odd thing to do. Like. We're basically, and maybe this is why, but we're basically at the point in the series where, like, I think there's an Assassin's Creed game coming out this year. I don't even oh, know. Like, yeah, they've gone to a yearly release cycle. Yes, yeah, so very few people, I think, not very few, I'm sure they'll sell plenty of copies, but sure. a lot of people don't give a shit about this series. And it, seems, <laughs> it seems, I mean, especially after the last couple of games, and it seems, this just seems like an odd time to choose to do this. Like, well, I, I, I don't know. I, I think for you and I, who have no interest in this whatsoever, and given the fact that Assassin's Creed is not... Or at least, I, maybe I'm wrong about this, but my perception of Assassin's Creed is certainly not that it's it's playing in the same ball field as Call of Duty or Halo. But I mean, perhaps that's changing. Maybe maybe it really has become just as big a, a franchise, and and you and I just weren't paying attention. Well, when certainly it, it sells a lot of copies, but it's not something like I don't I don't hear a lot of people on this website that are passionate about that ser- about that series. People. Yeah. But that could, just be, that could just be our community, though. It could be, because we have the most intelligent community <laughs> in gaming, and so it's possible that that is just our community. But Just kicking it while it's down. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> in, in all seriousness, there's, there's nothing wrong with this. As a matter of fact, I think this is a great idea. I think that... <laughs> I literally I, I, thought you were going to say, in all seriousness, there's there's nothing of value in this. That's right. Well, but no, no. That, that is what I'm saying. But I'm saying that conceptually, this is a great idea. The idea that a studio or a, a publisher is going to set up a community based around a franchise and they're going to create or facilitate, pardon me, this interaction between the fan base and the developers and give people exclusive content and the ability to talk with the people making the games, that's all great. That's all a great idea. But in my opinion, the only way that it really benefits is if you actually give a shit what you're 
community has to say, and I'm not sure that Ubisoft does. I I can't disagree with that one, actually, Brent. So anyway, I, I guess that I, I will say that I hope that this that this new council for Assassin's Creed will will allow perhaps some of the community's enthusiasm and ideas to uh, to maybe get incorporated into the series through this interaction with developers and, and maybe that will uh, maybe that will lead to Assassin's Creed being an even better, more popular uh, game franchise. And maybe we'll get lucky and Ubisoft will stuff it in our mouth and this next Assassin's Creed will actually be the bomb. Uh, that, that'd be fine, although I, I don't know. I've kind of given up on that. I, I, don't, I think I've just sort of reached the, the point where I can accept that Assassin's Creed as a video game series is never going to be what I want it to be. And therefore, it's my Meaning responsibility. Fun. Yes. <laughs> it's okay, my I just want to make sure to move on and play something that is fun. Something like That's Grand right. Theft Auto 5. Oh, so fun. Which is the bomb diggity and is not getting any fucking single player DLC because it turns out Oh, that there's the connection to the intro. It turns out that the <laughs> multiplayer for that game GTA Online I is cannot believe this number. the priority right now. Sega is how they have 8 million players every week. That is insane. To play GTA Online. That is a lot of people. And due to the fact that GTA Online has really taken off and I think taken Rockstar by surprise, they are not prioritizing, which is another way of saying they aren't doing... <laughs> the single player DLC for Grand Theft right. Auto Five, or at least anytime soon. Um, the development staff who had been working uh, on GTA Five and presumably content uh, DLC content for GTA GTA Five had now moved over to the GTA Online uh, team. They're focused there now, and they are going to uh, they're going to continue to support GTA Online quote in every capacity. Uh, Rockstar had previously Which promised... Which means selling you DLC soon. Yeah. Rockstar uh, had, had promised at one time substantial story DLC for Grand Theft Auto, uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's not materialized, and, and who knows if it will at this point. But one thing that is sort of interesting to note is that the, the much-anticipated and much-celebrated uh, heist missions from GTA Online... Uh, which were finally released this year after after people asking about them for such a long time. Uh, they have, have apparently been a, a huge success, but we're not sure how much how much more we're going to see of those because apparently they are incredibly difficult to do. And in the uh, in the the VG twenty four seven article that we're linking to here, the uh, representative uh, from Rockstar talks about the fact that they really did. They really did bite off a little bit more than they could chew with those heists. That they, they turned out to be much more time-consuming to put together than they thought. So that may not be something that they are continue, continuing with, given uh, given how much effort uh, it apparently took to get them the first time. But uh, anyway, that's not to say they're not doing new stuff. They talk about free mode events, which are public events. They're going to kick off in GTA Online every 12 minutes, and those are coming, is it this week or next week? Uh, I guess it's next week. Uh, to uh, PlayStation Four and Xbox One and PC, that that the free the free mode events are not coming to uh, PS3 or 360. So uh, I don't know, Lauren. I I'm disappointed by this because number one, I haven't played a ton of GTA Online, or not nearly as much as I would like to have played GTA Online. Uh, so story mode DLC would be the kind of thing that is maybe more my speed at this point. And I thought that. Rockstar has done a tremendous job with single player DLC in the past, vis a vis Grand Theft Auto 4 and Red Dead Redemption, as an example. Yeah, it's so true. I'm I'm a bit disappointed that they're not they're not pursuing that. I can't blame them for wanting to support GTA online though, because obviously they're you know, that's really blowing up for them. But I, I don't know, what do you think? I mean, is do you think that it's a mistake to to do this and, and does this portend that Rockstar is just going to go the way of Battlefield and Call of Duty and stop doing single player games in favor of multiplayer games. I mean, is that is that what they're saying here? No, I don't think I, I don't think so. I mean, who knows? Maybe it is. I, you know, I saw the headline for this and I thought, oh, that kind that's kind of bullshit, and I was a little bit upset about it. And then, like yeah. you, I, I read the article and I went, 
okay, 8 million people. I get it. Like, I get, like, that's a, that is a staggering number. A to, I, I, and I, like you, I have played almost no GTA online at all. And it must be goddamn good because 8 million people is a staggering number I, to the point that I almost don't believe it, honestly. But, right. like, it's so, that's a huge number. I almost don't believe it. But, um, it's uh yeah i mean i I, what i mean i can't you can't blame them that's a that is a that's astonishing if they i mean they they, could sell dlc for 299 they ought to be supporting them a hundred percent but i i would be uh shocked if it meant that rockstar turned into a multiplayer only studio and doubly shocked honestly if we didn't get a a red dead 2 no i'm not i'm not really suggesting that other than just you know to be flippant i think that i think that rockstar's games are amazing single player experiences they're they're known for it. they do a tremendous job with it the fact that they've been able to incorporate really compelling multiplayer along with that which yep. they have since well I, I i played a little gta 4 online but but mostly my entry with rockstar multiplayer was in red dead which was a lot of fun and and it's it's tremendous to to have the the game world that you're already familiar with be the playground for your multiplayer mm-hmm. and so on and so forth now hopefully this this uh might uh, portend a even more awesome and robust um, uh, Red Dead multiplayer. You know, I mean, that would be awesome if they could, if they kind of leverage their experience doing this and put it into a Red Dead multiplayer. At this point, uh, having a really awesome and robust Red Dead multiplayer would require having a fucking Red Dead game to attach to Dude, said it's coming awesome, it's coming in 2016 player. i feel it it's coming in 2016 listen I, I i feel something too but i'm almost positive that it's it's baked beans that i'm feeling i'm not sure that i'm feeling <laughs> fucking red dead redemption 2 welcome back everybody and we're going to join you in the clubhouse now have a bit of a discussion, but first we're going to go to the poll results from last week's topic, which was talking about Steam Early Access and actually how successful Early Access is and yet how few games ever seem to make it out of Early Access. It's an interesting conundrum. Lauren, how do the poll results shake out? So last week, Brent, you asked the question, does it bother you that so few games make it out of Steam Early Access? And this is how the votes shook out. Coming in in fourth place with just 8% of the votes. No, development takes time and incorporating community feedback even more so. So uh, a lot of people, I'm sorry, a few people were very understanding or a lot understanding. Uh, Coming in in second place. were understanding a lot. uh, My experience has been good, but I've been very selective. Kind of of along the lines of you and I, Brent. That was with 19% of the vote. That's where I would be. Coming in in second place with 26% of the vote. It's a complete mess of people paying money for broken and half-finished games. Yeah. Uh, and coming in in first place with a whopping 48% of the vote. I have not purchased anything on Early Access. It's not for me. There you have it. So Yeah, so half of our listeners that voted, uh, just not even interested in participating. Which, uh, you know, is probably for the best, it, it, because I, I, I kind of feel like Early Access is one of those things that if you don't really believe in, maybe, maybe a bit like... A, Maybe a bit like crowdfunding. If you don't really believe in it, you're not really behind it. It's not one of those things you want to get into half-assed. Either you want to you want to believe in it and do it and roll with the experience, right? Or you want to stay away from it. It's a high, hundred percent agree with that statement, Brent. So, well, well done, said. Outlaw Gamer audience. Uh, moving on, we have yes. another topic that uh, came from a listener. Aaron B suggested a a really really interesting article that uh, appeared on Forbes and is talking about the Mad Max review scores specifically, but also generally yet another kind of discussion on review scores and the way that the 1 to 10 review score scale increasingly is the 5 to 10 review score scale and how that can, how that, that can work well and perhaps not so well when you have certain outlets that are really using the whole scale and certain outlets that aren't and the expectations that people have about what a five out of 10 means versus a seven out of 10 or whatever. So Lauren, I will throw to you to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, what, what did you think of Paul Tassie's article? 
I thought it was an interesting perspective, Brent, and that's why I thought it might be interesting to talk about. You know, we've talked about review scores. We've been doing this show for nigh on about five years now. Yep. And uh, it stands the reason that we will probably uh, revisit this topic multiple times in that time span. And we have talked about it. Seems likely. But I, I don't know that we would have talked about it specifically from this angle, and I thought it was an interesting angle. And thank you, uh, Aaron, for suggesting it. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I haven't really consciously thought about this, Brent, but I agree with what the author of this article says, that more and more the industry is sort of um, subconsciously gravitating to essentially using a 5 to 10 scale to, to review games. I mean, it's very rare that you see outlets scoring games below a 5, and I think that it's commonplace that if you see a 5, you know, he akined it to a sort of uh, A through F system, like the grading system in America, in American most a lot of American public schools. Um, and if you were to see, uh, you know, 5 being an F and 10 being an A, and if you were to see, for example... Um, a game with a five, that that would be a very bad game. And and I would have to say that, in general, if I saw a game with a five, I would assume that is a very bad game. Yep. Um, uh, And that, that, however, there are some, and again, he uses the Mad Max scores because it came up with Mad Max, and he uses uh, particularly, I think it was Polygon, uh, who gave it a four out of ten, or maybe it was Jim Sterling. It it was Polygon. Uh, Phil Polygon gave it a five out of ten. Five out of ten, I'm sorry. I think Jim Sterling gave it a four. I can't remember. Um, but this idea that of, of how much it sort of skews uh, the um, aggregated review scores, which is so common. Obviously, Metacritic is the biggest outlet for that, but it's not the only outlet for it. Um, and how that, that really skews, uh, not only skews the aggregated score, but also, you know, there was a tremendous amount of ire uh, launched at these uh, places uh, for their very, very low review scores. And I think it's because most of the gaming community perceives that as, at this point, is almost hateful, almost hate speech. Yeah. Um, and what, one of the issues with, with Polygons, I, oh, I think, was that a lot of people felt like there was a disconnect between what the author wrote about the game uh, and the score of 5 out of 10. And, and I think I didn't actually, now that I think about it, read the Polygon review, but what I was reading that they were, uh, their, their issue was that, that he makes it sound like a, like a good game, not a, not, not, or not a bad game. A decent game, yeah. a sort of middle of the road game, and I think we've come to expect a middle of the road game like that to get a score around seventy. Uh, and when they when he gave it a five, I think that's that people perceive that like a, a real dissonance between what he was saying and how he was scoring it. Yeah. Well, that's um, <laughs> in a nutshell. That's uh, that's why I really don't have much use for review scores right there because I I, I think one of the most telling points of the article for me is when uh when when Paul Tassi says that after reading Phil Kolar's review of Polygon he agrees with almost everything that Kolar says in his review he just doesn't agree with the number and that in a nutshell is is why review scores to me are are, are pretty much worthless because you can have this you can you can have this conversation about what the game entails and, and, and how it feels and what it means to you, whether or not it's shallow and forgettable, as, as Phil Kolar suggests in his review or whatever. But then attaching an arbitrary score to that, suddenly it changes the context of all of those subjective criticisms that, in this case, two people agreed on. But then they get to this number and suddenly, whoa, what the fuck are you talking about? And it's like, well, just get rid of the fucking number then. Because it obviously, you, 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 know, you and the reviewer agree on more points than not. The dissonance is derived from that number. And, and, and the number is designed to be a shortcut. That's, that's all a review score is really good for. It's designed to be a shortcut. It's like, I, I don't really want to read this whole goddamn thing, but I want to have some idea of whether or not this is a good game. So we assign it a number, and it's pointless. It's fucking pointless. And I really, really see. I, now I disagree with you there. Okay, well, well, tell me why. I disagree with the pointless part, and here's why. I do as much as I want. I, I, I want to be able to say it's it's one of those things. Like I feel like I'm a bad person for giving a shit about reviews. Yeah, I want to be able to say that I just don't care about reviews, and I never look at them. I want to be that guy, but I'm not. Yeah. And I do look at them. There are certain things that I won't. I don't give a shit what the reviews say about Uncharted. I will buy it. Yeah. Um, uh, Just Cause 3, I will probably buy no matter what. But, yeah. but for a lot of games, I like to look at the reviews. However, I don't like to read them because 
I don't want any spoilers, and I do not trust journalists. I want no spoilers. Things that pe- other people don't consider to be spoilers, I consider to be spoilers. I don't want to know anything. I want to know as little as possible about the game. When I'm, and so I, do, I actively do not want to read the review until I've played the game, but I would like to know, in general, is it well-received or is it not? And so I do think there is value for some sort of cross, quick reference. I don't think it, there's oh, no, absolutely I, no value to it. I, I, I agree with you. I, I totally agree that there's value in quick reference, but just not arbitrary number scoring. I, I think that what we talked about a while ago where Eurogamer and what was the, uh, what was the other outlet? I can't remember now that they were they were going to stop doing review scores and they were instead going to do like a one or two sentence summation like a review summation that was going to replace their review score so if you didn't want to along read with whole, you did, along with Eurogamer does like a like they put they have like a badge system and they have four levels they have like essential like you've got to play this game yes yes th- th- a silver correct. which says this is a very good game Nothing means it's a middle of the road game. You could t- play it, don't play it, whatever. And then there, and, and I and have yet a, to actually. And then the other one was like avoid it or something. Like absolutely avoid this. And I have yeah. actually yet to see an absolutely avoid this. Uh, but um, right, but there's so there's a quick reference in like is, they, this is essential or recommended or yeah. it's just okay and a two sentence like summation. And, and I think it's perfect. I, I agree. To, to me, that is the model f- model to follow because you get what you're talking about. You get that th- that quick shorthand reference point that is not going to include spoilers. And I, I, can, I can do with or without the badge system. If, if people really need that, if people really need to see like a gold, silver, or bronze badge or a, a green, yellow, or red you know, color or something like that. If they really need that, fine. If that's the point we compromise on, I, I don't care. But I think that that real brief summation and and their badge system, I think that's a great model to follow because it allows you to have the best of both worlds. You get substantive shorthand for what the game is. You can look for key words like boring, you know, slow-paced, uh, repetitive, frustrating controls. You get some substantive evaluation of what the game is from that reviewer's perspective. And you don't have to read the entire article. You don't have to spoil the game for yourself if you're concerned about that, so on and so forth. So I I really, really do think that the review score is something that could easily be supplanted by that if, Gamers themselves w- would get behind it. I, I I guess that I feel like the only reason it's still ha- this it's still happening is because of a certain expectation on the part of game readership that wants to have it, and then Metacritic. Well, and even even Meta. I see. I, I you know it's interesting, Brandon. The more I look at Eurogamers reviews, the the and their their system, the more I want to start an online petition for all outlets to go this way. And I think you could still... Uh, let me, if I may, Brent, I'm going to read you four reviews. All right, I'm going to give you four reviews in, in 30 seconds. Yeah, do it. Starting with uh, Mad Max, they gave it the silver recommended seal, and it says, like Shadow of Mordor before it, Mad Max sees Warner Brothers thoughtfully apply its filmic property to an open world. Metal Gear Solid gets the gold essential seal, uh, and it says, Hideo Kojima's farewell to Metal Gear Solid is a dream, the best ever stealth game and the high point of a remarkable series. Until Dawn got the silver recommended seal, and it says, Weird, gory, and surprisingly moving. Sony's long-delayed slasher tribute is a flawed but memorable step forwards for, quote, interactive movies. And Trine 3 got no seal at all, which means it's sort of middle of the road. And it says, Trine 3's vibrant world and creative physics puzzles are as appealing as ever, but the transition to 3D is a painful one. And those are perfect. Those give you a great idea. Absolutely perfect. They, I mean, they're absolutely perfect in every way. And if you want to read more, and I was like, oh, I want to read more about Trine because I'm not worried about so- story spoilers. Yeah. Um, I want to read more about Until Dawn because I finish it. Um, and Metacritic could still exist with this system. Medic- yeah. if I would still absolutely. love, I still want an aggregator. I, I don't need yes. one number. But I, I, when I go to Metacritic, the first thing I do is click on there underneath it. It says twenty seven reviewers or whatever. Yeah. I click on that so I can look at all of the review scores and who wrote them, and and so just to have one place where they all show up and I can look down and see the two sentence description and the seal next to it, I would go to I would still go to Metacritic every time, no matter and, like, that. and regardless of that single score. And I, it's just it's it's absolutely brilliant. And I, I actually I think somebody out there should start a petition for all gaming websites to change this system. I agree with you, and I, and I would I would actually further that by saying that 
that Metacritic could be petitioned to support this now. To su- because th- there's there's one other. Well, I remember when we originally talked about this, when Eurogamer switched to this, there was at least one other outlet that we mentioned that was doing something similar. They, I don't think that they were doing the badge system, but they were doing the they were doing the summation I don't know. in place of. I don't know who that was. I know people score. have gotten rid of review scores altogether. Yeah, but like rock paper shotgun or whatever. But I, I don't know that anybody else did the summation that I. I mean, I, I'm not. I can't remember. But that, that's that's all you need. Like, like I want to I want to go to I want to go to a, a games page on Metacritic, and I want to see. I want you know I want to see like a. I want to see like a link that I can click that's going to give me that two sentence summation from those twenty seven outlets that have published reviews on it, and I'll just sit there and spend three minutes reading that and you know just looking to see is, is everybody consistent is it is everybody talking about control issues in this game oh yeah I, you know control issues control issues control issues you, you can very instantly get a picture a, a very accurate picture of how people are responding to this game and and it cuts out this arbitrary score system which in my opinion is a shortcut to thinking and just creates <laughs> just just creates expectations and dissonance and doesn't actually solve any problems. I, I don't think that the review scores are nearly as helpful as people think they are. I think that people are maybe sometimes uh, afraid to, to move away f- from it for, you know, for not just understanding that there is something else that they can do or for fear that, well, that means I got to read the whole five page review and I don't want to do that. And that's not the case. There's this other thing that we can do that is even more effective and just as just as time consuming, which is to say not much in terms of digesting it. We just need to do this. So yes, petition websites, petition fucking Metacritic. And once again, we will have changed the world for the better and not be able to take credit for it. We're a lot like the ghostbusters on this show. You know what I mean? Like we're we're like, we're, we're kind of awesome, but also pretty rubbish. And we save the world, but we don't look really good doing it. And at the end of the day, nobody really cares. And we always end up covered in white stuff. Wait. Oh. Go- Ghostbusters. Is that that movie with Melissa McCarthy? You're dead to me. You're dead <laughs> to me. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's hit the road. Talk about some of the games we're playing this week. I'm going to go first do it. to Lauren, who's going to put the yep. throttle down That's on me. Mad Max. That actually yes, worked much better than I thought it was going to. If I <laughs> said you were going to put the, th- the throttle down on Braid, that wouldn't nearly have worked as well, or wouldn't have worked nearly as nearly well. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, so Brent, a couple, two games I played this, uh, this last week. 99% of my game playing this week was Mad Max. I It is like... It is it is it's, it is crack cocaine. It is literally like I can't stop playing. I turn around. No, Lauren, you're wrong. It's 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 boring and forgettable. I'm reading the review on Polygon right here. Clearly, <laughs> right now, it says you're wrong. I play this game, and all of a sudden, three hours of my life disappears. I turn it off, and I'm licking my gums. I don't know, like <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on with this game. Um, <laughs> what a lovely image <laughs> it is all I want in the, my whole life right now is a goddamn V8 engine for my car I'm very attached to my car there are points so I think I told what you Brent you have? that at the very beginning of the game there's like six different car bodies in the very beginning of the game you have to choose one yeah and, you, and your and wife chose for you she chose for me she chose the Die Rolla, which is not the last car I would have chosen yeah I want I'm more of an American muscle car kind of th- kind of guy and, yeah uh, it turns out that uh, and then throughout the game they have all these um uh, other builds that they have, specialized builds that they you need to build for certain you know missions uh, to move on to certain co- story content that sort okay. of thing. And so, um, like so one's you end like up really about combat, one's really about speed, like that. Kind right, of stuff. Like you have to do a race with the, what they call the speed demon, and to do that, you have to unlock all the appropriate parts for it, okay, and okay. you have to run the race driving it, and it's like the muscle car body or whatever. And um, and uh, uh, I find now that when I'm playing anything but my Dirola. Uh, I, I I don't like it. I actually I'm really connected to my car, which is I think an awesome aspect of the game. So it's kind of replaced um, your shepherd. It it has it has kind of replaced my shepherd in a way, and I'm very attached to it. Yes, um, you were very attached to that shepherd too. That shepherd. Oh, that's still wasn't that a title? Like, didn't we have a didn't we have a fucking title of the X Factor? Uh, very attached to attached your shepherd. To my shepherd or something like that. Possibly. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm loving the game, man. It continues to be fun. I did get to a point where I'm having to do a little bit of grinding at this point because I had to yeah. to unlock further story content. I had to 
uh, or, you know, buy certain things and to buy certain things, I had to get enough scrap. And so, so I yeah. did have to do a little grinding, but I've now been to most of the areas, at least in a passing fashion. And the game just continues to astound me, astound me with its beauty. I've taken 140 screenshots at this point, several of which are posted um, under a gallery called Mad Max in game photos. Those are all my photos. I created a separate gallery. Um, this is on outlawgamers.com. On outlawgamers.com. People can take a look at it. The, the, they're, they're stunningly beautiful. The game is unbelievably gorgeous. And I'm just, I'm 30 hours into the game now, Brent, and I'm still like playing it as joyously as ever. Thoroughly enjoying the game. Well, that's awesome, man. I, I've not been playing Mad Max past just the first hour or so that we talked about last week. Yep. I, I own the game at this point. I, I actually used my, I, I've had trade in credit at, uh, at G2K games forever that I, I just haven't, I haven't ever used, and they happened to have a copy of Mad Max when I went in there, and so I finally got a chance to to use my use some of my trading credit. But I've not yeah, been, I've not been back to it just yet uh, because I've been playing uh, Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pain, which I am looking forward to talking about. Uh, unless you would like to say a little something about Rocket League before I do. Yeah, just a little something is just that I pick, did pick it up again this week. Uh, they actually are out of beta okay, now. Okay, that's great. So, so moving on they, to Metal Gear No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they uh, finally, season one is underway. So for the next couple of months, your ranked matches will actually count. And uh, you can rank up and you can win extra content. Oh, cool. Uh, I did find that it actually has made the game... I, I played it for about 45 minutes. And it actually made the game more frustrating to me than it was before. Because oh, yeah? now when I'm in matches and I get into matches with people that suck... It completely screws oh, well, my you, ranking. You have something on the line now, right? Whereas yeah. I, before I didn't, and now it matters, and consequently, it's made it. Sig- I played a, a lot. Like, uh, I played a lot with myself, Brent. <laughs> uh, and uh, Lauren, this is the 21st <laughs> century. That is not anything to be embarrassed about. Okay, uh, that is 20th and, century uh, thinking right there. Well, I did get to. I have been playing with some of the um, outlaws, which, which is tremendously you want fun. Me to tell I also you about how much I play with myself, Lauren. Would that make you feel <laughs> yeah, better? No, no, that will certainly will not help. <laughs> um, that will not improve the situation. Um, so we. Uh, so, but I had played also a tremendous. <laughs> I put a tremendous amount of hours into that game, just getting randomly into matches, and now I don't want to do that anymore because. Uh, I have something on the line, so uh, hopefully it will pressure me to play a little bit more with the folks from Outlaws. Uh, I know that the PS4 is going to have an upcoming uh, clan support coming soon, but yeah. Uh, yeah, tremendous amount of fun. Rocket League, love it. Okay, let's hear about Metal Gear Solid. Nobody cares about Rocket League. Speaking of the clan support thing, you, you, you're, of course, referring to PlayStation System Software 3.0. Sir, yes, sir. And I heard from a nameless individual... Uh, yes, who sir. claims to be beta testing 3.0, and they they didn't reveal a lot of details, but they said that it was very very cool. So, yes, I haven't actually turned on uh, my PlayStation since that nameless person has been beta testing. Yes, but I believe that he invited a couple of OGers to test the to test that functionality. All right. Well, I gotta I gotta log into my messages then and see because I have it on my PlayStation. But I haven't been checking my messages, so if you've sent me one, I apologize that I've not responded to you yet. But that's on account of the fact that I've been playing Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, a.k.a. my favorite game ever. No, really? Uh, dude, I fucking love The Phantom Pain. I fucking there's, there's love this game. There's literally nothing about this game to like. You, not wa- literally nothing. You are so wrong. There are I'm just like I'm 10 kidding. out I'm of kidding. 10 things to love about this game or something like that. Anyway... Uh, Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pain is fucking awesome. I sat down and started playing this. I I got through the the prologue area, the one that you were talking about last week, the yes. crawling simulator. I did not I did not have nearly the negative experience that you did. The uh, you know the, the you do crawl for I don't know five ten minutes and then you know you start to stumble and then eventually you're up and moving around and I I, I felt that it it all worked out pretty good. That section was very evocative. It's it's surprisingly tense, and there's of course these really, <laughs> these really interesting sort of horror movie aspects to it. With uh, with I'm trying not to trying not to do anything specific with spoilers, but there's there's scary things that happen in that prologue sequence. But anyway, once you get into Afghanistan and get into the game proper, it really really came alive for me. And, and what they have created here, what uh, Kojima Productions has created is a sandbox, ha, 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 for you to play soldier in. <laughs> and in some ways, it's the thing that I've basically been doing my whole life. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, you know, me and my friends, you know, we were always playing army in the woods and stuff like that. And, 
you know, sneaking up on, you know, fictitious uh, installations of bad guys and that kind of thing. And I mean, that that's what Metal Gear Solid is. It's just, it's this fantastic sandbox to, to just play soldier in. And uh, it's, it's so satisfying for me, particularly given my methodical nature and given my love of, of stealth and strategy, because the game rewards and encourages my type of gameplay. And I, I like to, I like to be patient, I, you know, without, without being told, although later on I saw that it was a, a hint that came up in one of the loading screens, but without needing to be told when you're dispatched on that first mission, which is to go in and rescue Miller, you are, you're given the information that, Oh, here's a village over here that may have some information on him. And you can go to that village or not go to that village. Of course I go to the village cause I'm thorough and <laughs> I, I just, I just did what made sense to me. And what made sense to me was to get up on a high point where I could see the village. And I just sat there with, I sat down with my binoculars. I say sat down. I laid down with my binoculars for 10 minutes or more, just watching the village and tagging all of the guards, the equipment, learning the patrol routes, figuring out how you, you like watching a guard and saying, okay, I'm going to try to get to that building. And there's a guard that patrols through there and he goes and he, he walks up the catwalk and he does this and he comes back down. And then it's, you know, like however, you know, however much time it is, like it's another minute and 17 seconds before he's back there. And so I have a minute 17 to, you know, to get in there and, and, and look for this stuff and then, you know, figure out what I'm going to do. And, I love that. I love that ability to to just live in that world and inhabit it. It, it increases the immersion tenfold for me. And so, you know, I go in there and I get the I get the documents, and then I, I decided that I, I'd leave with a bang. And so, I created a diversion. I it, in in that in that part of the village I'm talking about where you can get the intel that gives you the specific location of of Miller. Uh-huh. If you climb up on the roof, there is a radio communications array on the roof of that building, and then also the building that's right across the street from that. And there's a long wooden, not quite a roof, but you know, sort of a long wooden, almost like a patio overhang that is attached to uh, to the roof of that building, the, the building with the intel. So I climb up on the roof, and I'm thinking about taking out this this radio array, and I see the one that's across the street. And so what I just did is I crawled out to the very end of this sort of patio roof. And I chuck a grenade to the, the first radio array. I chuck a grenade to the second radio array. They pop and everybody starts running to that area, which is exactly where I want them to be. Cause I'm going the opposite direction. Everybody goes on alert status. They go to investigate the explosion. I hop off the roof, hit the ground and hightail it out of the, uh, out of the village. And it's just, it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding to kind of observe the village, put together a plan of action, execute on the plan and for it to go exactly the way you want it to, which is they never even knew I was there, you know? And, uh, well, except for the grenades. Yeah. Except, except for the grenades. But I mean, they, they never saw me. They, you know, other than the explosions, they had no fucking clue what was going on. And if I'd have had plastic explosive on me at the time, uh, you know, I'd have been even further away before that happened. But um, it, it was really it was really cool. And then I went and I went to the to the location to rescue Miller, and basically did the same thing. Like I, I just spent what I actually did was I was running down the clock because I was waiting for it to get close to dusk. I wanted to go in at nighttime, and at this point it was it was uh, afternoon. And so there's a uh, there's on the other side of the valley across from the installation where Miller's being held, there's a, there's a bunch of trees and tall grass. And I just laid down in the tall grass under a tree with the binoculars. And I just sat there and just let the clock run down close to uh, sunset and observed everybody. And I figured out a point of entry. I, I had kind of a theoretical idea of, of where I might be able to get in kind of behind where he was being held. And it was, it was the same thing. I mean, I went in and it didn't get spotted. I, I got into his cell. I got Miller, pulled him out, and I made it out of the village. And no, I mean, like nobody saw me. Nobody even knew I was there. It didn't take on any guards. Zero presence whatsoever. 
And uh, it was really, really cool. Now, I actually ended up redoing that mission because I wasn't paying really close attention, and I didn't realize there was actually like six p- possible objectives in that mission that had to do with like things you could do in other places. Like there's a there's a barracks, and you can you can like capture the commander and fault him back to mother base, and you know some other things like that that I just I didn't even pay attention that those were things I could have been accomplishing. So I went back and redid that mission to get all six of those things. But that's the thing. It's just like for the kind of game I want to play and the way that I want to play it, Metal Gear provides me everything I want. It encourages my specific play style, or at least it rewards my specific play style, if not encourages. And although now you could argue that those aren't different in any way. Anyway, uh, but I love it. I fucking love uh, the Phantom Pain. I'm having so much fun with it, man. That is awesome. I, I'm I'm very happy to hear that. And I know I know that many of our listeners will be very happy to hear that because they certainly there's tons of our listeners who are loving the experience and don't want to turn on our show and just hear me talking about how I don't like it. And I'm not bashing the game. I'm really just talking about how I don't like it. Yep. Um, but that's not. <laughs> No, those are two different things. Yeah. I mean, I respect it as a game, and I understand why people like it. Uh, I just have in the opinion that they're wrong. Look, I'm um, not telling you that this game's shitty. I'm just telling you this game is <laughs> fucking terrible. No, no, no. And you know Wait, it's, what? No, and I do, Brent, I want to take an opportunity really quickly, because a couple people, again, took issue with me comparing the game to Until Dawn last week. You mean graphically? And I tried to explain this in comments, and I just want to really quickly just try and explain it, like... Uh, verbally, so so people maybe can understand it. I, I was I, I wasn't trying to compare the graphics one for one from Until Dawn to uh, Metal Gear Solid Five Phantom Pain. All I was trying to do is make a statement that Metal Gear Solid Four to me was a graphical benchmark. It stood out for the extremely high level quality of its graphics when it came out, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, Metal Gear Solid Five. I had that same expectation based on what I had seen before, and was simply stating that it doesn't doesn't feel not not that the graphics in Metal Gear Solid aren't fantastic. They are. They just don't feel like they stand out. Uh, and I, I was saying, I was. I mean, what's that? Well, okay, good. That's fine. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And, and it's it's not a negative thing about the game. The graphics are are, are fantastic. It, it was. It's more of a commentary on on my expectations and my expectations being let down, not the quality of the game. Okay. Um, I, I expected Metal Gear Solid when I turned it on to be a game that's, whose graphics blew me away. Uh, that is a hundred percent probably my, uh, like inappropriate expectations on my part. I'm not blaming the game in any way, shape or form. All right. And I was simply trying to say by comparing it to until dawn, I was trying to say compared to its contemporaries until dawn being the most recent game that I played, but many other games currently Metal Gear Solid five does not stand out graphically to me. Now, some people so argued that you know for an open world game it's graphical standout uh, and that is probably very true i agree i i, I think well and and th- that's what i was going to say i don't think until dawn is and and people have probably already pointed this out so maybe i'm repeating but that's okay uh, until dawn might not be the most apt comparison given the fact that one is a first party title one is a third party title that appears on multiple platforms you know the other is only got to deal with one set of hardware one is an open world right, game, let me stop you real not, quick brent because you know, you're doing so exactly it, let me stop you for one second only it, it because it's a bit apples and oranges well it's it it, it, it doesn't matter though it's, you're doing kind of what i think that other people are doing no, and, I, and i think I, it's I just a mis- saying, that it's, it, interpretation of what i'm trying to yeah. say it is apples and oranges that's not my point it's less about the I'm comparison not, and more about what you're expecting a hundred percent i'm not I'm it is apples that, and oranges you're right i'm just that, saying that what you were expecting was stupid well, that's very possibly true. <laughs> I was expecting to turn the game on and be like, "Holy shit, this game is incredibly impressive looking." Well, and I and, and I simply wasn't. I said I w- it was not my reaction. Yeah. Um, but I, however, I was so thinking I was try- about like Mad Max, like you know, which I had just played. I was thinking about like Mad Max, and I was thinking about like Grand Theft Auto Five and The Witcher. You know, like those were the games that I kind of had in my mind when I was looking at, 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 at. So I was definitely doing more of the comparison thing as opposed to, I guess. Uh, you know, like that sort of uh, ethereal expectation that you're well, but, talking but, uh, about. And, I'll get, and people are going to shit themselves when I say this. I'm not saying that Mad Max is better graphically. Myself? Hang on. I'm not saying Mad Max is better graphically, but in, in, in Mad Max, I have stopped uh, 140 times I've stopped the game because it is so overwhelmingly beautiful yeah. that I feel the need to stop. Way more so, even though Metal Gear Solid Five might be crisper in the animations and have better, I thought I think Mad Max was more astonishing graphically to me than Metal Gear Solid was. 
Um, okay. If that, I mean, it's I, and that's, I haven't that is enough a, of Mad Max to to evaluate whether or not I agree. It with is you. a completely subjective, feeling based analysis. It is not uh, unquestionably if you if you compared side by side the character animations in the game, Mad Max would come out on the shitty end of the stick, and I'm sure that the anti-aliasing in Mad Max isn't as good as it is in Metal Gear Solid. But but overall, just the feeling of it, like Mad Max has blown me away and how good it looks, and Metal Gear just didn't. It, I, I don't know why, it just didn't. That's all I was trying to say. I do recognize that like trying to do an analysis of graphic quality, comparing, say, Until Dawn to Metal Gear Solid is not a fair thing, yeah, but that's not what I was doing. It's ultimately I was, kind of futile, because I, well, it's, it's like the... I, I wasn't trying to do an analysis. I was yeah. just trying to illustrate how I had, an, un, may, albeit an unrealistic one, an expectation of the game, and that expectation was let down. So anyway, yeah. I hope that makes sense to people. I, I wasn't trying to directly compare it to, to Until Dawn, but... Um, Except for the part where either you way, did. But- either way, uh, <laughs> I think that... I, I'm so glad, Brent, to hear that you're enjoying it and loving it, and I hope that when I get back to it, I feel the same way. Right now, I'm sort of in that land with Mad Max, and, I, and I'm glad to hear you're loving it. I can't wait to hear uh, more as you play further into the game. Yeah, we'll kind of be ships in the night, I imagine, you know, because like, I'm finishing up Phantom Pain and, and heading to Mad Max. You might be going back the other way. Certainly in, in regards to those games. And then one day we will come back together, embraced, embrace one another, and finish The Witcher. Uh, yeah, I, I really, I, I'm going to have to dedicate time to The Witcher because I, I really want to be playing it. And actually, that's a great segue into the sunset, because as you may or may not uh, be aware, the Witcher's first, or the Witcher 3, pardon me, uh, the first major expansion is coming next month. And as part of that expansion, physical Gwent cards are officially on the table. We're linking to an article from Game Informer that has all the details, but... um. Hearts of Stone is going to be the uh, that's going to be the first expansion, ten hours of gameplay. If you get the retail collector's edition of the Hearts of Stone expansion, that's going to include the monsters and Skiotial Gwent decks, the physical Gwent decks, and then presumably if you get the retail collector's edition of the Blood and Wine add-on, which I, I don't I'm not sure when that's coming out, but it's coming out later. But presumably, the retail version of that collector's edition is going to have the other two decks, which would be Nilfgaardian and Northern Realms. Um, the uh, The retail version is going to go for nineteen ninety nine, and the the Gwent cards themselves are actually going to be made available separately if you already have the what, what do they call it the expansion pass. If you already bought the expansion uh-huh. pass that covers the two expansions that are coming out, there is an option for you to get the physical Gwent cards. You know, for like like the cost of shipping and handling, or something like maybe like ten dollars or something like that. Uh, you're, you're in theory going to be able to get them, but I believe that you have to you have to have already purchased the expansion pass in order to uh, to qualify for that. Otherwise, you're looking at getting the uh, the retail version. So, Lauren. Physical Gwent cards on the way. Are, are it, it's not exactly having the nope. iOS Android mobile uh, mobile app, but it is yep. it is I think a pretty cool thing. All the same, are you excited in any way for this? Nope. You <laughs> suck. I, I think it's cool, but I, I really I really want the mobile game. I want and the it's, mobile it's, game it's, too, it's but that's born to be a mobile game, and it's ridiculous that it's not. And at this point, honestly, I think after this length of time, it's it's actually it's it's borderline. I don't know, treason. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to overstate it. <laughs> no, but, no, I mean, not, I think not on that, this show. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think it's very cool, but I really would just prefer to have the digital version. I, I so. would like to have the I would like to have a mobile app too because I think that would facilitate playing. Well, okay, like as an example, I was thinking, okay, if you and I do this, if you and I go and get this retail release, and we both get uh, we both get decks, we could play over webcam. You know, like set up the webcam, face it down on the desk. And we could play Gwent over Skype. And I was thinking, like, the mechanics of how that has to happen. Like, okay, so number one, you've got to, you got to, like, lay out your deck ahead of time or just, you know, use Scout's Honor that you've got the minimum number of unit cards in your deck that you're supposed to, the maximum number of special cards that you're supposed to, that you're doing a thorough shuffle, all, all the, all the kind of, like, various rules and things that Gwent has in terms of, like, the special abilities for each faction. Like when Northern Realms wins a round, they get an extra card, and you know, like those kinds of things. 
and then also the the whole thing with like uh like like the spy cards like if you know if I put down a spy mm-hmm. card it counts towards you and then you know you can take it if you got a decoy card play it play it on my deck and you know just those kinds of things it, it's it's one of those things that it really only works in person or in some kind or of or for ninety nine cents on the app store or for, yeah or in some kind of you know some kind of like digital game that is handling all that. All Let's put it this way, dude. Stuff for you, for, for the standpoint of their company, I'm not going to spend 19.99 on the expansion pass uh, to buy to get these cards. I'm not going to do it. Yep. Uh, but I but I would spend 4.99 on a standalone game uh, uh, and play the hell out of it. I, so. I, I agree with that. And the fact the fact that they haven't the fact that they haven't done it, I don't know. It, I, I it does frustrate me. I, like I, I don't want to speak ill of them, but it, it does frustrate me. And the statement that the guy made, like you know, we talked about, it's been a few weeks ago now, I think, but I, and I can't remember what it was. Like, was it at PAX or something? But anyway, the statement that the guy made, you know, when they were at a crowd event and somebody said, you know, hey, when we're going to get the you know standalone, blah blah blah, you know, when's the Gwent cards coming out? And he said, you know, made some sort of like sly comment about the physical cards, and then said, oh yeah, the mobile app, like that's an interesting idea. I'll have to I'll have to pass that on to the game developers, and it was just like. What? Like, why would, why would you need to pass that info on to the you know game developers? Like, every fucking person that's played this game has been screaming at you for this, and I don't like that reaction. Seemed, I don't think that it was intended this way, but it just it really kind of came off as aloof, I guess. Yeah, I don't know, but we'll see. I, uh, it hopefully will be coming down the pipe. All right, Brent. So for my end of the sunset this week. Uh, I've got an article on some website that I've never heard of and will probably crash your computer. Uh, huh? the, the article is called uh, is titled Mother and Father Create an Amazing Portal-Themed Bedroom for Their Son's 13th Birthday. Right, yes, it is. This. you heard correctly. They created a portal-themed bedroom for their 13-year-old kid, and it is freaking awesome. And this, this was shared by bedroom? one of our listeners. This is the actual bedroom, this- and I, I could not not share this with the universe because i'm going to do this for my child so as well so it, please it's a mirror with with a light around it it's a uh, no it's several things the whole room is painted and uh painted to look like a portal room and it's awesome okay, yeah 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 uh, I, I get that but i mean like the actual portal i'm seeing here this is they, they've mounted mirrors on the wall with lighting like orange and blue lighting behind them for the mirror yes the that's mirror parts yes brilliant. the portal that's fucking brilliant it's absolutely brilliant. brilliant and they're directly across from each other yeah so they create the portal effect <laughs> uh, and then the, the doors are painted to look like the doors the entrance chambers with the check mark and the x and i mean it's absolutely brilliant you have to, you just you have to go look at this it's freaking awesome and i want to paint my bedroom like that if i can convince my wife to let me do it oh man i i all i can say is i hope one day z loves portal because i would love i would love to give her this room yeah, it's awesome. So check that out. Wow. That's all we have to say about our end of the sunset, guys. This week we're not going to do a ride along because we took two of our ride along suggestions and worked them into the show themselves. So, uh, but we do want to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, we only had about five or six Brent uh, ride along comments last week. We want more comments from you guys. Jump into the ride along. Tell us what you're thinking. What you want to hear us talk about, we're always interested. Uh, and Brent, with that, I think we've come to the end of the show. As usual, we want to hear what our listeners think about everything we talked about, whether it was Into the Sunset or Up in the Road, Mad Max, Rocket League, Metal Gear Solid Five, The Phantom Pain, what we talked about in the clubhouse this week, uh, the review scores, and are we actually reviewing games on a 5 to 10 scale, and are those reviewers that aren't ruining review scores? And then, of course, what we talked about Up in the Garage, GTA Five's multiplayer only dlc moving forward with eight million weekly players ubisoft revealing assassin's creed council the social media hub that every other franchise had already did two years ago need for speed closed beta sign up sign up for that on the ps4 and the xbox one or the outer lands documentary series presented by area five whether your comments are about that or anything in gaming we want to hear your thoughts on all of it as usual he is brent adams i and lauren Baumgart, and remember You don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing.